Good afternoon, Riga. Now, I feel I need to give you a few pointers before I, before I go any further. One is, I have no timer. So this could either be six minutes or six hours, unless someone drags me off stage. Secondly, I've just had the mic attached to me. I'm wearing kind of pretty much skin-tight stuff here. Um, I'm not going to say where I had the mic attached, but I am going to say that it's quite heavy, so at any point, the lower half of this suit could start to descend. So if it looks as if I'm beginning to get caught halfway across the stage, that could be the reason. So you could have a very interesting view of the future. However, I am head of innovation at a company called Brandwidth, and we do genuinely design the future. Now, I know a lot of people will say, you can't predict the future but you can design it. So we work with a lot of startups. We work with the big guns at the other extremes, the Apples, the Googles, the Microsofts. And what happens in between is the clients that we work with obviously want to know what they should be doing. Now, we don't really want them to come to us and say, we think this is what we should be doing, because more often than not, they've got some information, second or third hand, and it's not the next big thing. It's something that was the relatively small thing about six months ago. So in order to do all of that and work with the people at either end that are really, really making a difference, it allows us to work on content that could appear in 12, 24 months' time. So we do genuinely get to design the future because we know when these things are going to appear with an almost 100% certainty, but there's never 100% in this. Um, but what the fuck is he doing up here with all this stuff on? Well, I'll try and explain that. So this is a great way to illustrate collaboration and disruption. Now, the collaboration is, is the collection of various pieces of technology here. Now, if you need a visual representation of the Internet of Things, I'm kind of wearing it. Um, but and then the disruption comes from the fact that the combination of all of these things is creating something that doesn't really exist yet. So that's actually the fun part of designing the future, is when you're not waiting for other people to design it for you, just simply so you can work with them. But you're collaborating on bringing all the right elements together so that we actually have something that someone else isn't doing. So that something that someone else is doing. I do wear a lot of hats these days, and it does involve me testing lots of technology, um, from virtual reality to demonstrating artificial intelligence through facial recognition in drones and uh, lots of stuff within mobility and yeah, actually cars and I'm um, a huge petrol head, so it's fun to play with that stuff. There's also a lot of crap in there. There's, uh, actually, to be honest, there's more bad technology out there than there is good. And we've talked a lot about failure. Um, and a lot of this is not just testing it and seeing if it breaks. Um, a lot of this is, is learning from other people's mistakes and helping others so that you don't need to always fail in order to learn. You can learn from other people's mistakes. Um, but let's get back to what, what the fuck I'm wearing here. So we've got the, uh, the situation I found myself in a couple of years ago. T3 Magazine said, you're up for anything. You work in virtual reality. Um, why not spend a whole day 24 hours in VR. Um, so I thought, well, this, is, this could be interesting. We can push some boundaries here. And I did. I spent 24 hours in VR um, with a variety of content rather than different experiences necessarily. But it was the, it, they were the headsets and platforms that were available and the type of content that we had access to. And then, as if I hadn't learned my lesson from that, 12 months afterwards, I decided I'd do it properly. But not just do it properly, do it twice as properly, if you like. Um, so I spent 48 hours in VR. Um, now, what the, the aim here was not to just repeat the first exercise, but do it twice as long. It was to see how we could best leverage the physical world. So we talk about virtual reality, and of course, we think about just that virtual environment and dipping into that and being somewhere that you, you, you're not. But when you begin to enhance that with the physical world around us, that becomes so much more immersive. So, for example, there's driving go-karts around a track when you're seeing something else, or being strapped to the top wing of a biplane while you've got the wind rushing against you and everything else that enhances that experience, that brings it more and more to life. Uh, and then, foolishly, got my first tattoo whilst in VR. Um, now, the reason for doing that was because there's already, already research in the potential for VR to mitigate pain, just with that level of distraction. So I wasn't happy with that. 
Uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about today isn't about just Googling shit. It's about getting out there and discovering lots of these things for yourselves. So I had the headset on. I had some fairly distracting content, if you like. It's pretty immersive um, VR gaming. But what that did was, if, if you know, the benchmark for the pain threshold, if you had that as a, as a 10 without the headset on, when the headset was then put on, I probably got that down to like a six or a seven. So there was you know, definitely evidence there to say that virtual environments, if, they're, if they are distracting content themselves, they can actually take you away from the pain that you're feeling. Um, and then in the corner there, it was to, it was to demonstrate the physical experiences again. Um, you know, that's just a, a boxing simulator, but it's the fact that it's not merely learning something. It's a, you know, if you, if you were going to do some, some VR training, it's very different to a simple VR exercise because that's just repetitive. If someone is trying to punch you in the face in a virtual environment, you're going to move around in a way that suggests that they're there. So there's, there's a definite element of training to that. Um, but that wasn't enough. It's never enough. It's always about moving on and pushing boundaries. So um, last year, I, I started to build out what you begin to see in front of you here. And this has progressed almost every time I appear on stage um, as the immersion suit. Uh, and across different levels here. So this was about how could we have something that you're wearing um, that give some kind of stimulus that adds extra depth to the virtual environment. Now, what you're seeing here is, is an augmented environment. So I have a heads-up display. So this is more AR than it is. It's, I mean, it's not VR at all. Um, it's a completely different headset. Um, but in order for me not to fall off the edge of the stage, sometimes I have to wear this headset. Um, now, the demonstration of the content here. So this, again, I'm not suggesting this is the view of the future. Thank God you're all saying. Um, no, this is not what you will all be wearing. This is, a, this is what we currently have at our disposal for the best pieces of technology to deliver as immersive experiences as we want. But it does cover a lot of different areas. So there's the VR, there's the AR. Um, and then wearables in general. I mean, that's been a market for years since we had Sony Walkman. Um, but you know, we, we think about wearables now as more of a market. Um, and that's kind of some of the things that I'm wearing here are, are extending that. Uh, and then fast tech is, is one key point here. Now, you may not think there's any kind of fashion involved in this at all. There isn't, believe me. Um, but the difference here is about bringing those markets together. So when we have fashion and we kind of, they're polarized. We have fashion and we have technology. And what they're not doing successfully in most areas, I mean, Levi's are, are tackling that to a certain extent. What they're not doing is bringing that together in a way that an audience is saying, I'm comfortable with wearing that because it's the thing that I want to wear and what it happens to be is useful rather than just buying something useful um, that happens to look good. So it, it's about getting priorities right and, and, and addressing those markets that people are already in. Um, and then fintech, so about building ways of paying and, and seamlessly paying and, and having access to content and environments without needing to bring out other devices. So those kind of things are built in. And Industry 4.0, I'll come more onto this in a second. It's about, again, this is not what you'll be wearing. However, more of this stuff are things that could potentially appear in enterprise and in industry because you know, you use equipment in your job. You don't say that it doesn't necessarily look good or whatever else. It's something that you're more accepting of. And then, of course, health, all of the monitoring that's involved in this, and the big I, O, and T at the end there is, is obviously, say, I'm kind of, kind of the living, breathing internet of, internet of shit, some would probably say. Um, OK, my connected nipples. Now, I, <laughs> so what you see in front of you here is actually the first time that I'm appearing on stage using the, the full body haptic suit. Um, so the Tesla suit is essentially, now when we talk about haptics, we would normally think about just things that vibrate and just give you an idea of something in a general vicinity. Um, and for, for gaming, that's been around for a long time. You have gaming chairs and all sorts of things. Um, but what this suit does is it taps directly into my muscles anywhere on my body uh, and uses an electric shock to s simulate um, a feeling. So if that happens without me being in VR, it's just an electric shock. And there is a market for that, I'm sure. Um, however, when I'm in full VR, anything that I see, I can also feel. Um, so, and, that, and that can be very, very specific. So exactly the point you've, you've been shot, you've been touched, you've had something you're picking up, something you are you know, essentially believing that you're, you're feeling, you actually feel. 
Um, now, the step on from that is that this suit also allows that in reverse. So someone could be on backstage. They're not. I'm not plugged in right now. Um, and they can then control my limbs. Um, now, that's suddenly we've taken a whole different step there. Um, now, what they do there is using the same muscle stimulus rather than it just simply telling you that something is happening. It's able to control various parts, various limbs, right down to the full digits on each, on each hand. So that opens up phenomenal potential for the future. So we'll cover that a bit more in a second. You've seen it, my connected nipples enough there. Um, now, what I have on my feet here, uh, Enco, Enco running shoes, which they are spring-loaded underneath. So they actually use and harness kinetic energy to deliver additional speed, additional uh, performance based on your own performance. This isn't something that's mechanically making me run along. It, you, you are having to work for it. Um, but it does give us the idea of those, pardon the pun, steps for the future, where we're thinking about actually even the, the monumental steps. That, you know, we, we, we will not allow drugs in sport. However, is there another level where we can start to think about enhanced sport um, and that mechanical additional engineering that gives us something else, another kind of category? Um, and then inside the helmet, so we've got the Solos Spark glasses in here, so they are um, giving me a heads-up display. Um, so this is essentially Google Glass for the slightly, you know, if, if, I, if this was the look of the original Google Glass, I'm not sure whether it would have been even more of a success or failure than it was originally. However, uh, in the right environment, this is giving that, that experience. Um, and then beyond that is full stereoscopic um, augmented reality from companies like ODG um, that again delivers that kind of full Iron Man experience where we have full overlaid content. Um, but then the, the bit that is, is always, always the fun stuff. So now my favorite piece of wearable technology, and this will always be the case, when I think about um, most wearable technology, it doesn't deliver on every level. Um, so, I have on my wrist <laughs> the rather beautiful uh, pyro, which is appropriately named, which gives me the opportunity at any moment to adopt more of that Iron Man persona. Um, now, as I say, what the great thing that this gives me is a piece of wearable technology that does exactly what it says it will deliver. So, it says it will shoot fireballs. What it did. Both times that I just pressed the button, it shot fireballs, and that's awesome. It does nothing else to tell you what we're going to do in the future, other than illustrate that some things may actually work. Um, now, what we're left with is, um, is that the exoskeleton I have on my hands here. Now, again, I'll talk about exoskeletons in a minute, but the, the, the idea that we have that additional rigidity, the, the strength, the, the, the ability to do something beyond our human capabilities. So, and, you know, we're, we're obviously talking about the superhuman here. Um, but the VR element um, is, is another step on. So, obviously, I'm not wearing that helmet here. Uh, and this, all of this suit does add extra. Uh, experience, um, less useful for AR, I mean, unless you're in a kind of a working environment. But for VR, it does really genuinely enhance the things that you're seeing. Uh, so foolishly, again, I was on the, the tallest, fastest city zip wire, which was in London um, last year, put all of the suit on and everything else, and slid down there whilst watching other crazy things in front of me. Um, and you'll be able to see that on a program for Vice in April, I believe. Um, okay, so. As I have no timer, again, I say I could have been on for six minutes or six hours. Um, what, I want to, what I want to talk about now is the future. Um, so what you see here is the present, because I've not actually delivered anything other than the things that are available now. So what I don't want to do is offer you a bunch of Googled research. I want you to think about the future with me. So. Let's start with exo and the exoskeleton and the potential for enhancing the human form. Now, I'd say we've already looked at these. Um, but there are great strides being made um, for people that have had disabilities that have gone through various levels and, and potentially need rehabilitation to a point where almost the medical capabilities catch up. Now, that's phenomenal. Um, and that's, uh, that's life changing and life, life reaffirming. Um, but what we're also looking at is within enterprise. So again, this is for enhancing the human so that we're not yet replacing them with robots. You know, in some, some, some instances, we're not entirely replaceable um, just yet. 
but that's about allowing us to continue to push boundaries without needing to rely on, on some kind of mechanized uh, equipment to do that. But actually what we're doing is, is using an exoskeleton to enhance that. Um, but then, of course, kind of coming back to the shoes, um, what's really interesting now is, is we're beginning to look at how we enhance sport and competition and adding lots of, of, of additional speed and strength and, and capability through just the exoskeletons, no matter what kind of size of those we're looking at as well. So some of that is the entertainment comes from the sheer scale of them. Um, so exoskeletons are going to be very important. Now, AI and mobility. Now, I've not just gone AI because everyone's talking about it. Um, what I'm talking about here is the fact that mobility in general and for automotive sector, this is, this is a huge change because the cars have never had to be artificially intelligent up to now. And what we're now facing is a time where the, the cars are becoming autonomous. Now, if a car is driving itself, it has to be fucking intelligent. Otherwise, it's going to drive into another car. And now, the things that aren't intelligent enough, ironically, are the humans that are on the road. Um, so until we got to that point, when we've gone right, you know, we've gone completely over, then the humans will be the ones driving into the side of the self-driving Ubers uh, and the ones that knock them over. And then all the headlines currently are about the cars can't drive themselves. No, the humans can't drive themselves. Um, but mobility is a huge potential platform um, because once the cars are intelligent and once whichever kind of vehicle we're talking about are intelligent, we begin to free up time. Uh, and when we free that time up, what do we do with that? Um, now we have a variety of things we can do. We could, that can be the mobile office of the future. That can be our mobile entertainment center. Um, but how do we entertain people? Now, you know, we obviously have a, a raft of ways to digitally entertain people already. Um, what it does is it makes VR relevant um, because I was with Renault before Christmas and I was in a Renault self-driving car. Uh, and then at a key point when you've got the car driving itself along the highway, you put on a headset, a VR headset, um, and you see the car around you. Uh, then you see a, a solar eclipse. You see the city of the future. And then bits of the car begin to drop away. And what the car is, and, and the content are doing is working hand in hand and playing on the fact that there is movement involved. And it enhances that whole experience. Um, but what it really does is it begins to show that VR is an acceptable platform when you take away the things that are current barriers, like cost and setup. And, being asked to use it, uh, and then that's, a, that's kind of a problem and, and a real genuine barrier. But when you take those away and it's simply something that's already built into a car, that becomes a viable platform, and the car itself becomes a viable platform. Um, now, XR. So again, that, that's kind of an extension of what I've already got here. So this is the XR immersion suits. Now, I, I hate all the other terms banded around. So I would say we've got VR, we've got AR. If you're adding MR to that, it's just kind of muddying the waters. But XR is essentially the term that covers immersion and that general collection of, of experiences and things that we can use to enhance the level of immersion. Um, and that will become increasingly more useful to us as creators, as people that want to place content in an environment so that we can keep pushing those boundaries. So, you know, this, this as, a, as a multitude of sins, a way of classing all of those realities is, is a way that they are going to become essential to us. Um, and then internal. So this is, the, this is the kind of the real tricky one. So when we think about the barriers to entry with hardware, we think about cost and we think about setup, but we don't really think about the hardware itself. Um, and again, I, again, I'm the walking, breathing, talking example of how painful this lot is to put on and, and wander around on a stage with. No one's going to do this. Um, but people aren't even going to be bothered to put on a regular VR headset right now. What they want is something smaller and lighter, and then when you go smaller and lighter, suddenly you get light leaks and the, the immersion and the experience is not as good as it was. Um, so that, that kind of fights against each other. So the, the tough bit to talk about is where do we go from there? Um, so you know we may go to contact lenses, which give us something, but that's kind of only delivering AR. But if you go for VR, the best experience you can have is something that taps into the optic nerve and, and then uses the brain to think about all the things that I'm currently simulating externally. That's a long stretch of the imagination, but it's still something to consider when you're considering an actual audience. Because we can keep going along a, and it really uh, an obvious progressive technological timeline where we say, of course, it goes from this to one of the... What's that? 
Oh, it's, it's, my, it's, my, it's my flamethrower it's just fallen off the wrist. That's amazing. It's like it was jet powered. Um, now, what, so what we end up with is something that you, you, you see a timeline where you assume that the, the technology will progress. But actually, we forget about the people that are going to be using it and how they will socially interact or not with it. So it's worth taking that, that leap of faith and thinking about where we will be. Of course, we're not there yet. And of course, even, even I haven't got something embedded directly in my brain. Um, and then finally, the... The, the key factor outside of all of this is, is the emotional. Because we are, it's very easy for us to focus on all of, all of the technology and think about the things. But it's something that we tend to neglect. We, we forget to think about how real people think about the things that they're using and, the, and the, the platforms that we're building and the type of content that we want to put on them. And it's very easy to think, you know, almost binary, it's, it, the, the kind of content is on or off, but it's not because the people that are using them are not on or off. Once they stop using it or the, the process of getting them to it in the first place, that's something they think about. And, and it, as soon as you start to think emotionally about this, you begin to address the reason why they are using your platform, your content, or your device. So that's why you know, I, 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 I want to leave you with of, of the five things. Emotion is one of those that we tend to put to one side because it's not the one that we can easily address because all the other stuff is just building things or making stuff. Um, but don't forget about the humans involved because, and the key thing here is, all of this stuff that I put on here is about enhancing something. Um, but what we, what we take away from that is something, whether we're inspired, whether we're trained or educated, or, or it's about making us better humans. All of the superhuman stuff is about you know, allowing us to do something else, but what it really should be doing is inspiring us to do something better. Thank you.